Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. The second one's harder to defend. But uh, my partner and I, uh, who I've known for years, thought that really to be successful in business, there were two absolutes. And the first was to understand reality, and then to be able to execute a plan against that reality. So we wrote the book, Execution. It did uh, far beyond what we ever expected it would do in the sense that it sold 1.6 million copies. And then we decided to do the one that was just introduced. And uh, the publisher said that, that we call the next one a prequel. In other words, if you write them in the wrong order, they call them prequels. <laughs> Apparently, it's someone thought we wrote this one in the wrong order. But uh, behind all this is a belief, a conviction that Regardless of the business you're in, it's getting more competitive. And there's lots of reasons why it's more competitive, but the three that stand out are one, globalization is here. In other words, we've talked about globalization for years and years. It has arrived, and with it has brought some excess capacity in some industries where making, being able to get price more troublesome, it's put pressure on margins. It commoditizes products faster than ever before. And it's made the quest for jobs, uh, frankly, a worldwide search and with lots of controversy with respect to outsourcing and, and the other attendant questions. It's brought some good to the world in the sense that we've never had a period like the last five with as little f inflation across the whole globe. It's not necessarily been a bad thing, but it has created some change. And the second is the enormous extension of credit. When I studied economics a lot longer ago than I'm willing to admit, we used to study from a fellow by the name of Joseph Schumpeter, who said that in this country particularly, we have creative destruction. So that when businesses fail and go out of business, the supply-demand balance gets restored. And at least to that extent, it was healthy. Well, now businesses fail, but they don't go out of business. The airlines are a, are a predominant example of that. And as a result, the supply-demand balance never gets changed. And the third major trend is the emergence of the power retailer. The Walmarts, the Home Depots, the Lowe's, and the like. Again, uh, they've all brought some value to the consumer in terms of lower price and in some cases easier shopping, but they've left a lot of destruction in their wake. There's no such thing as a local hardware store anymore, for example. And uh, in the case of, of Walmart, who's done a terrific job, people are surprised that uh, they're the largest jeweler in the country. Now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't associate jewelry with Walmart, but that's the kind of position they enjoyed, not to mention toys and ever-growing presence in books and the rest that you're all aware of. So the point of all these three things is to, is to step back and say, whatever business you're in, you have to make sure you understand what's going on. In other words, do you understand reality and do you have some idea where this marketplace is going? And if you do, then you ought to take some action now. We identify in the book that there may be some structurally defective industries. In other words, industries where it's not clear what the right answer is. The large airlines, United Airlines, American Airlines, Delta, isn't clear what they do there. Even the large automotive companies, General Motors has a 3000 a dollar per vehicle cost disadvantage just because of the legacy costs as they relate to pensions and health care for retirees. Costs that are not necessary if you come into this country as a new entrant from Japan or Europe or whatever. And uh, how they overcome uh, that significant disadvantage isn't easy. Uh, thirdly, the commodity rubber business in this country is in trouble. So aren't commodity chemicals. Uh, the steel industry has essentially already left this country. And it may well be in the national interest that we're supposed to preserve some of these industries. There is a view that, that let free markets rule the day, and if whatever can't work here, can't work here. But if you look at our national defense, the automotive companies and, and, and prior conflicts, as well as the basic rubber business, have been uh, pretty pivotal in terms of the, how we, we defended ourselves. So I'm not so sure it's a good idea to let them go uh, out of business. 
but yet I'm not clear as to what they should do to, to overcome their particular dilemma because frankly they've waited too long to confront reality. If these matters were confronted 10 years ago, the number of options that they would have had would be substantially lo a longer list than they are now. And that is the essence of the argument that you can't continue to deny reality because when you do, you have less options in terms of how to correct uh, whatever needs to be corrected when you find it. There's a view among business people particularly that if nothing else, they're realists. But the fact is there's an enormous amount of corporate denial as it relates to reality. And it's interesting to just to take a minute and identify some reasons why people don't confront reality, either in their own lives or in the businesses in which they operate. In the first, uh, we would call filtered information, where you basically surround yourself uh, among people who think the same way you do. And even though that thinking could be obsolete or incorrect, it nonetheless, it carries the day. And that is the, the web that you stay involved in. And the second is uh, selective hearing. Lots of people only hear what they want to hear. It was evident in the presidential debates. If you liked Bush, you thought Bush won. And if you liked the other guy whose name I don't remember, you, you, you thought he won. Uh, so people do hear what they want to hear. And that oftentimes uh, isn't useful in terms of determining the present day state of things. The third, there's a whole bunch of wishful thinkers who see the world the way they'd like it as opposed to the way it is. And they, they tend to think that downturns in business are only cyclical in nature, although some of them might be structural in nature and therefore things won't rec recover. You've seen it, people with rose colored glasses. While I talk about some of the, the structurally defective industries that I mentioned a moment ago, and if I were to look forward, I, I have worry about the pharmaceutical industry. Pharmaceuticals have been an enormously profitable business. They've been terribly helpful to society in the sense that they've, they've brought life-enhancing drugs uh, and have done so in time periods far more compressed than ever before. But the fact is the country hates the way they price these <coughs> prescription drugs. Uh, they're of the belief that instead of helping health care systems, that they're essentially in opposition to, to good health care. And there's going to be a change in the industry. And either some of these companies are going to lead that change or they're going to be dragged along kicking and screaming in a way that isn't going to be nearly as pleasant as it otherwise could be. So we, we, it, we, we try to set forth in the book that have, if you have an interest in finding reality, and there's a good number of people who don't, because the other, one of the other factors is fear, that if I find reality, I don't know what I can do with it, so why should I try to discover it? But if you do have an interest in finding it, we, we put a mechanism in place that we think that can be useful, and that is to, it's got four pieces. The first of, you have an external uh, reality. In other words, what's the environment you're in? What's the industry? What's the growth rate of the industry? Uh, who are the comp competitors in the industry and how, how they're doing? using root cause analysis to separate why some do better than others. What are the regulatory influences and how might they change the game that I'm in? Who are my customers and how healthy are they and how are they apt to change over time? And some companies now have taken a couple of days uh, every three or four months to focus on this question of what environment I'm in. They bring in outside experts on the subject and have a real robust dialogue so that they can draw some conclusions about what is the environment and what they might do about it. In other words, there, there has to be, if you understand the way the, 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 the environment is trending, you might want to take some actions to take advantage of that, or if it's negative, to countervail that. But once that's done, then the, the, it's, it's customary in this business model that I'm describing to set forth your financial aspirations be they revenue growths or cash flow or whatever. And then on the right side of it, the internal realities. What's the strategy you're going to use against the environment that you've defined? What are your people's strengths or limitations? What organizational uh, grid do you have in terms of bringing your product to market? And how does that cope with the environment? And then, and then finally, and most importantly, an iteration process to make sure these three things are in sync. A lot of business plans that you look at and that I look at are basically dead on arrival because these three, these three things are not in sync. In other words, someone's saying we're going to grow our revenues 10% in an industry that grows 2 and there's no bridge that explains how it's going to get to 10. 
or that there's a technological breakthrough that's going to be required. There's no history of any technological breakthrough in a company. So the purpose of iteration is to make sure that whatever you're projecting uh, in, the, in the environment on the one hand, with strategies, people, and organization on the other, are, are, are in a way that's re relatively coalesced. Now, you, once you find that, you may not like the answer, but at least that's reality. Then you can take some specific steps to do what you have to do to get to wherever you'd like to go. Uh, but w if you don't define reality and, you, and therefore you ignore it, you, you're basically planning in a vacuum. And, and ultimately that vacuum catches up with you because you can't be successful. We spend a number of, uh, time, a number of uh, pages in the book talking about some companies who've done this well and some companies that have not done it well. One of the good examples is Home Depot. We, a friend of, of mine, Bob, Nard Bob Nardelli, who was at GE, went to Home Depot. And he looked at the external environment and liked what he saw in terms of the growth prospects, the customer base, the competitive situation. He saw the financial aspirations and thought uh, that they were reasonable, but then got into the strategy, the people, and the organization of the company and was aghast. Uh, Home Depot grew very rapidly. It was a company essentially that didn't understand process. And as, as little as two years ago, they didn't even relieve inventory in the, store, in the stores with a system. They did it manually. So there was no control over inventories. So Nardelli put $2 billion uh, of investment into systems. He strengthened the store managers at principal, principally by, by hiring uh, second lieutenants who were being discharged from the service uh, organizations as people who were disciplined and could, and could fit into the grid that he was trying to assemble. And then slowly... Uh, and took a lot of criticism in the process of ruining what was the, then perceived to be the culture of, of uh, Home Depot. But as you notice in the last year, things have come back now in Home Depot. Same store sales are up. They're opening more stores. There's even a store in Manhattan where there's a doorman to greet you, <laughs> fully attired. And so uh, it's, he's being recognized in terms of, of what he did. But here's a situation where he was specific in terms of what needed change and he changed it. There's a lot of leaders in the world who get labeled as change agents and change things whether they need to or not. It's just as important what to know to know what to leave alone as it is to change. We use an, an, a number of other examples but one including Sun. Uh, I've known Scott McNeely for uh, a number of years. He's had uh, several near-death experiences as you know with that company. But when the telecommunication market collapsed and Cisco made some substantial changes, as did EMC, Sun essentially didn't do anything. Now, in the last six months, they've done some things, and a lot of people have written off McNeely in times past, and he survived, and he may survive this time, too. But on the other hand, he certainly didn't respond to a relatively significant change in the environment uh, that came about as a consequence of the collapse of telecommunications. So we spent a lot of time trying to make the point to people Make sure you know what, what it is to change before you change it, and then when you do change it, change it in a way where you have a quantum effect as opposed to one that's just on, around the edges. We also spend some time talking about the kinds of people that are going to be necessary to have leadership roles in the future. And uh, we all, uh, I think, appreciated the book that Andy Grove wrote a couple of years ago, or more than that now, called Only the Paranoid Survive. And I'm not, we're not preaching paranoia, but we are saying that leaders have to be constantly in the marketplace to understand what's going on. In other words, to listen not only to customers, but to listen to experts in the industry, listen to their own employees, because you're going to have to be far more nimble and move far more quickly than you've had to move in the past. They also have to be adaptable, uh, and, and they have to... They don't want, you don't want to have people who hold on to things that have been successful too long. You know, when you retire, it's hoped that your ethics and your values will be the same. But you'll think differently about business issues in the wake of new facts and new developments that you've been exposed to. And when, when I go in, I do some consulting now, and, and people say offhand, well, this is how we do things here. I roll my eyes. Because that isn't to say it was wrong to do it that way, it is, but it, neither is it to say it's the right way to do things now. So people have to be self-confident enough to give up ideas that work in place of something that now will be better. And some people do that easily and some people don't. Thirdly, there's no room for, for 
egos, uh, because people with big egos don't listen. And if you don't listen, you don't learn, and you don't stay contemporary. Neither is there room for isolationism. You have to go out and be a part of the businesses that you're in. Uh, I'm interested in the Walmart story with Sam Walton, and when Walton started, they said he spent more time in the Sears stores than anybody in the executive ranks at Sears, trying to figure out how things worked and how Walmart could do it and better. And I think that's a, a skill that's going to be required and be useful. And then leaders have got to forge people to work together in whatever way a culture is comfortable in doing it. You know, you, you want on the one hand to have independence, but on the other hand you want to have coherence because the sum of the parts is larger than the individual efforts of a unit. Uh, we, we tell a story in a book, I was running a, a big division uh, in the West not long ago and I had a ma manufacturing organization and a big sales and distribution organization and led by two people who both were very effective but not only didn't like each other, didn't work well together. So we were, we were not optimizing the opportunity. And I talked with them on several occasions and they promised me on every, each occasion that they would learn to work together and maybe not like each other and then nothing happened. So I went in one day and, and I, I took a security guard with me and I called him in the office and I gave them both severance packages. I said, now these are very generous severance packages because you've both done well. On the other hand, we can't afford to keep you any longer because you refused to work together and, uh, and we've talked about it about as much as we can. So I'm going to ask you now in the company of my security guard, which I tried to make as dramatic as I could, <laughs> to leave. And they did. They left. And, I must tell you, I had a nervous couple of hours because I needed both of them. But about three or so in the afternoon, the telephone rang and said, well, there's two people without badges who are trying to get in the plant. And so I said, well, have the security guard bring them up. And they came forward and they said, well, we've thought about this uh, and uh, we think we can work this out. I said, now, why is this any different than the last times we've talked about it? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll take the severance packages back and I'll put them in the drawer. And if we ever have to have this conversation again, there's going to be no further conversation. Well, they, they, they did begin to work together. And as not only they did, but their organizations did, and our performance increased dramatically. The point of being is this. You can't ignore things such as that, because if you do, it hurts everyone. Everyone around you, everybody in the marketplace, and everybody knows as a leader that you're allowing this to happen, that you don't confront reality, and therefore you don't straighten it out. So, at the end of the book, the question is simply this. Uh, whether you're running a gas station or you're running a Fortune 500 company, ask yourself, do our people, and do I as a leader and do our people understand the reality of the business we're in? And are we, are we addressing some of the issues that, that arise as a consequence of what we have found? And if the answer is yes, I think you're in good shape. If the answer is no, then you better find a way to get at it because it's going to have a major impact in terms of how you're going to do over time. So with that, uh, I thank you for coming, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Yes? Uh, I find myself needing to take issue with your comment on the debates. Fine. Um, uh, a slim majority of people in this country voted in favor of Bush. A not-so-slim majority thought Kerry won the debates. Doesn't this indicate that millions of people were able to see the truth, even if they didn't like it, and belie your assertion that uh, people can't hear it? Well, I mean, I, I used it as, I, I, it, it's an interesting point because it, it, never before in, in the history of elections have we seen the polarization that we saw this, this year. You had the West Coast and the East Coast and you had everybody else. Uh, but, uh, no, I, I do think that uh, I, I'm a Republican voting for Bush. I thought Kerry won the debates. I didn't vote for him. Because I thought just because you're a better debater, it doesn't necessarily mean you ought to be the person running the country. Uh, but I do think people were influenced by those debates. Well, to what extent, who knows? Uh, but you tend to, if, if you're listening to somebody and someone says something that you believe, that makes a lot more impression on you than them, they're saying something that you don't believe. You tend to ignore that and, and you document in your mind the things that he says you agree with. So it's just the way the world is. Yes? To that point, when we're talking about 
talking to our leaders about things that they don't believe and we're the middle management of the company that are trying to, you know, rise up the truth. Yep. What are some really good strategies around articulating that so that we can get the message across? I think you have to have, and I, I pro you probably do have here, but, you know, there, there has to be sessions, uh, what we, I used to call skip level sessions, where people have a chance to say what they want to say doesn't necessarily whether they have to have names on their on their shirts or not because that isn't the point of the session but you've got to listen to what people have to say and if you get organizations that listen and respond to new ideas uh, then you tend to have a far more accomplishment oriented culture if everything is suppressed or is excused that's also culture forming and is far less effective so I think in terms of the leadership on the one hand, middle management on the other, there has to be good interaction and good listening going on uh, in order for both to be as successful as they need to be. Yes? You're talking about bridging the gaps from the different sides. How do you balance that with um, new entries in the marketplace where you purely have to take a chance? Well, for, first of all, uh, I, I, by defining reality, it doesn't mean that you don't have to take chances. If you, argue, if you go across the corporate balance sheets today, corporations have more cash than they've ever had before. And clearly, I think it's because we've become risk averse as a company. In the wake of the corporate scandals, uh, in, in the presence of Sarbanes-Oxley, where everybody's running around trying to fill out all these little forms, uh, I don't think we take the risk that we need to take anymore. And ultimately, that's going to decide our growth or our lack of growth, because you, you know, risk is, is essential in order for businesses to be successful. So I don't mean when you define reality, you have to stay there. I'm just saying that is an appropriate place to understand and start with. And then you can build on that depending on what your own ambitions are. Yes? I'll be greedy. I have three questions. It's all right. Our top four capabilities as a leader that have served you well. That's my first. How did you figure out what you did not have and how did you cover for it? Second question, how did you spot other leaders? Uh, I, I think that in terms of the, the first question, uh, uh, what serves you best in, in, in terms of, uh, uh, everybody has a different style. Uh, and uh, so what serves one well will not necessarily serve another well. One, I like to work with people. And uh, therefore, it was easy for me to interface with people. I think, too, I have been a good listener. Uh, and I hope, at least, that I tried to keep my ego in check so that I would continue to listen and listen and grow. Uh, I liked the introduction of 360 feedback mechanisms, and I took them myself. And as a consequence, I knew where people thought, at least, that I wasn't performing the way that I might. And four, and most importantly, uh, I had lots of self-confidence. Now, I don't know how you get self-confidence. I think I got it from my parents. Uh, but to whatever extent you can give others self-confidence, you not only help your life, but you help their life as well. I think those four things have, have, have served me well. When I talk to others, I, I'm more interested in what you've done than what you think. I, I've been well served to avoid philosophical wanderers in this world. And if you can tell me what you've done, I get a far better impression of who you are than just what you think. The interview process is flawed because some people interview very well and can do nothing else. And some people don't interview very well and are terrific. So you can't be, you can't be influenced completely. So, and I've also learned to check with references, people who've worked with others, because that's the best insight that I have in terms of, the, of this person that I'm thinking about hiring or not. So, you know, as, a, as kind of a fabric, on the one hand, you want to keep your ethics in place. You want to understand your values. You want to be open-minded to change your views in the wake of new information. And then you want to adopt a style which you think can be effective in terms of interming, in, intermingling with people and the other things that I mentioned. Uh, people who have... Leaders who have trouble are people who often don't understand themselves. They haven't gone to the point of understanding themselves. Not everybody is good at everything. So one aspect of your question is, what did you do in that wake? You know, I never was hesitant to hire somebody better than I was in a certain area because I knew that would make me better. If I had to be the best in everything we did, we would not have been nearly 
as achievement oriented as we were. That I assure you. Yes. I heard your comment about um, your views on philosophy, but so but this is philosophical, just the same. It's all right. <laughs> um, you're in, we're not having an interview, so you can go right ahead. Right, right. So part of reality is that while work is important, the people who work for your organization have other aspects of their lives going for them, like family, um, community service, and so forth. So how are you able to address um, work-life balance on uh, two levels? One, for your organization as the leader, and then secondly, on a personal level, how were you able to advance your career and what trade-offs did you make along the way? Uh, I'll start by saying that uh, I have nine children and one wife. It's <laughs> <laughs> a necessary clarification. Uh, so, so I certainly had the honest. issue. Yeah. And, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to forfeit that significant role in bringing up children. I liked it and uh, I thought it was necessary. So I, I adapted my, I had, when I was coming through General Electric and I spent 34 years there, I had people who uh, understood that if I came in at 4 o'clock in the morning to work, I would go home at 6 o'clock so I could have dinner. When I took leadership roles, I have the belief that you, at the end of the day, you get better employees if you have well-balanced employees. I worry about people who work all the time. They burn themselves out and they become significant bores. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do, if, whether it's music or sports or whatever, but it's healthy to have other influences. When you raise children, it's healthy to get into the things that they're interested in. So I'm not, be, I'm not of the belief at all that you have to have one or the other, that you have to have this blind pursuit for, for business success on the one hand at the expense of your family. I think you can do both. And I think it's important that you do, you do do both. If you were to talk to my, my, my wife had a significant influence on my children, there's no question about that. Uh, but my children would tell you that I was involved in their lives, sometimes to the point where they wish that I wasn't. But, so I think it's a great question. I think it's something you ought to think about and you ought to do, you, you ought to manage in your own way. I mean, I don't think the, there's only one way, but I think what's important is that you do manage it. Yes? Terrific. Thanks for coming over. So, I'm kind of interested uh, about like, your opinion about maybe external issues that they're missing out on or external realities maybe that they're missing. In the, in the, in no, I, I think, you know, Honeywell is a company for those of, just briefly for those of you from Microsoft, that has had a big materials business and industrial business, which was the old Honeywell and a significant aerospace business. And, uh, you know, I, I think all three of those businesses in pretty good shape. The materials business has gone through a restructuring in sense that a lot of the things that were great became commodities and it wasn't an attractive place to be, but I think they've sorted that out pretty well. Uh, Honeywell has an asbestos issue, so they're going to be dramatically better off when tort reform happens, if it ever does, and I think there's a chance that it will this year. But I think they've been realistic in terms of the things they do well. Uh, I was in Phoenix the other day and I noticed they're going to put together the, the avionics businesses uh, uh, in a, trying to get a, more, a bigger critical mass, at least as I understand it. I think that's probably sensible. So I'm happy that they're confronting the realities that they're faced with. Yes? Um, you talked about listening to your employees as part of, of uh, coming up with your view of reality. And yeah. One, one company I think is the poster child for not listening to their employees is Hewlett Packard. There's, I know a lot of uh, people there, and boy, the difference of opinion between those employees and between what management does and the people on the ground is significant. I don't know what reality is over there, but I wonder if you had any thoughts on You know, I'll, I'll be careful what I say about it uh, because uh, uh, it's easier to criticize. But let's just say this. That's a very unhealthy culture over there. I don't think there's an easy conversation that goes on between the top and the bottom of the organization. I don't necessarily think they surface the issues that they need to surface in order to resolve. Uh, I'm not saying that this is at Carly Fiorina's place. I mean, she came in and she has an enormous job to do. Uh, but if you spend some time at Hewlett Packard on the one hand, and you spend some time at Dell on the other, there's a dramatic difference in terms of the cultures of those, of those companies. And so far, it's also been manifest in the results that they both have. So unfortunately, I think Hewlett Packard has some, some work to do to get to a better place. Yes, in the back. Um, when, a, when a leader steps into a new role, what should be the game plan 30 days, 60 
60, 90, a year and beyond? What, what are some of the activities they should be doing? You know, I think the first thing you do in a new role is listen. You talk to all the constituents, your customers, your employees, and you get a good handle on what's going on. And uh, by virtue of this interrogation, if you will, that you go through. And then you come back and say, okay, in order for us to get to either our objective or another objective, we've got to do two or three things a lot better than we do. Then you put a plan together and you go out and you sell it to your employees as to why, what we're going to do and why we have to do it. And then you make, make them feel as though they've been a part of it. And then you keep that up year after year. In other words, you don't sit in your office and decide yourself what needs to be done, but you involve a lot of people in what needs to be done. When the more buy-in you get, the easier it is to accomplish. And the more you do it in isolation, the more difficult it is to get done. <coughs> yes? When you look at a company, what are the primary questions that you ask? of yourself or of them in order to figure out whether they are confronting reality or not? You know, uh, I, there's a number of ways that I, I think you can sense it. Obviously, you can look at their position in the marketplace. In other words, how successful they've been, have they been in the space that they have enjoyed vis-a-vis -vis others? And you can, you can make some conclusions from that. But a more difficult question is, which is, uh, is <coughs> inherent in, in your query is this. Which ones are losing their sense of reality that might be performing well now, but on the other hand, uh, may in fact be in trouble? And I use Big Pharma as an example. But one of the things I, I, I like to do, I like to see how the head of the organization uh, reacts. How, do, how does he or she live? When I do consulting, I like to look at, at the, the, the schedules of the last six months. Where do you spend your time? When I find people out going to banquets every night and, and essentially uh, not doing the things they're getting paid to do, it causes me concern. If I see a formality in an organization, it, it bothers me. I like informal organizations where communication is easy. If I see a lot of turnover, that usually means frustration, that people somehow are not being listened to. I like to look at exit, exit, exit interviews. Why do people leave? I like employee attitude surveys. What are people saying? When you put that body of knowledge together, you can come to a pretty good conclusion about the health of the culture and whether or not they're, they're contemporary in terms of the issues that they're going to confront. You know, it's not always, the con not always that easy, but you can find out, it seems to me, if, if that's what you're set out to do. Yes? How about the team or whatever the relevant organization is, what are the types of questions you can continue to ask yourself as, you know, in terms of are we in touch with reality? I, th I think that's a great question. I, I think that, you know, teams ought to get together and sit and, and ask themselves, now, this is where we are, this is what we ascribe to be, aspired to be, what's, what's missing? Why has our competitor done better in this space than we have done? Uh, and the more open and candid that discussion is, the better the subject matter that will come out of it, and the more you can do about it. And I think that ought to go on a lot, not once in a while. Uh, you know, people who are paranoid, as I mentioned with Grove, about these kind of things are those who happen to keep, uh, I think, ahead of their environment better than those who don't. Yes? What were your biggest um, mistakes in business, and why did those occur? In what do you do about it? Do you repeat them? I made a lot of mistakes, uh, clearly. And, uh, you know, I, I tried uh, when I found a mistake to not blame anybody because I often was involved in it and to, and to fix it and move on. I think there's too many leaders who know that they're in the wrong path and they stay there too long. And as a consequence, uh, more damage happens. But, I, I mean, specifically, we decided to exit the auto parts business because it was getting to be a, a very competitive, uh, low margin business and I thought we could use our resources better than someplace else and make a long story short, we sold our automotive brake business to Bosch. And at the time, Bosch came in and they also wanted to buy our friction material business, which are wear parts that you put on brakes. And someone, we also had a materials business and somebody said, well, this is a material. In other words, we can fit this into a material business, even though we're going to sell to the same customer base. 
and I weighed the, the offer that Bosch had made on the one hand with the internal argument that we ought to retain it, keep it, if you will, and add some technology through our chemical know-how, and decided to keep it. And we couldn't give the damn thing away two years later. I mean, we weren't able to change the technology enough to make it to differentiate ourselves. It became a commodity, and uh, it was just a horrible business decision. And uh, so, you know, you make a lot, if you make enough choices, you're going to make some wrong. But you, my, the point is, aim, own up to them and move on. Yes? Uh, you talk about confronting reality, like a uh, company like GE has transformed itself through Six Sigma digitization, globalization. So just um, in your opinion, how would you compare Microsoft to a company like GE? I know, I, I know GE a lot better than I know Microsoft, so I'm not saying I'm in a position to answer the question. I think GE has done a good job of being candid about all the businesses they're in and allocating resources on a sensible basis to those who have more promise than others and even exiting uh, businesses which they didn't think they have a promise. Microsoft is a much younger company uh, going into uh, a, a far less certain future I think than General Electric has in this, in this respect. I mean Windows has been such an enormous success at Microsoft. I do know that you guys are fighting hard to find other profit niches that can propel the company in the future. Whether that's being conducted on a realistic basis, I wouldn't know. Well, at least we got the MSN. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> MSNBC, too, which hasn't been a great success, I might say, for either party. But uh, so I can't tell. My, you, you guys living here can tell that much better than I can. You know, you, you, you're doing a lot of projects that uh, indeed need the question, is this realistic or not? Are, are we chasing a star? Or is this achievable, and will it result in something that can be put into an offering in some way to make money? And uh, I hope you guys are asking those questions all the time, because it's essential, that's essential to the, your success down the road. Yes? Mr. Yes, sure. Okay, fine. I'd stay here all day, but I can't. So <laughs> one more question, please. I'd like to hear your thoughts about the superior subordinate relationship, how you relate to your boss as a CEO to the shareholders and, and at, on other levels. How do you make this a very productive relationship in which each grows and there is good alignment? You know, in terms of a boss to subordinate for the sake of discussion, you know, I think you try to set an environment where people can be successful, number one. I think that you give that employee a good assessment every year or whatever. And that when I say a good assessment, I mean you talk about the things the employee does well, <laughs> you talk about the things they can do better, and you offer to be helpful about those things they can do better and you ask that employee to do the same with those who report to him. So there's a good candid a performance appraisal going on and give, giving people a chance to grow. Uh, and I did the same with my board. I asked for an appraisal from my board every year. I set forth my goals and I made them or I didn't and I got an assessment. But uh, I don't think you have a good boss subordinate relationship when you berate people, when, when you put undue pressure on them. I mean, you just do it in a nice, you do it in an open environment and you have candid exchanges, but you make it pleasant for people to work. And if somebody doesn't work out that, and they have to leave, then they have to leave. You don't have to make that a destructive event either. And I, but I think that the, the generation today is far better working with people than the generation of my time, where we had tyrants in control. Now, that's given way to a far more rational interface, I think, and, and therefore the companies are better. Sorry, uh, I'll be happy to sign all the books that, that, uh, that you have in your hands and thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to be here. <laughs>